So what we're going to do today is we're primarily not going to be talking about Racket per se. We're mainly going to be talking about functional programming in general through the guise of Racket. So I'll be kind of covering like the basics of functional programming. Uh, and Matthew, afterwards, will talk about some of the advanced features of Racket that make Racket particularly interesting for functional programming. <coughs> when you open up Dr. Racket, um, if you've opened it up for the first time, uh, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this, but you may need to go to the language menu here and click choose a language. And you want to choose this top one, the Racket language. Um, until then, you won't be able to run programs. Um, this is just a minor detail about Racket. Racket is a language that's used for writing all sorts of languages. And so kind of like a shell script, the first thing you need to do is tell it which language you intend to be writing in. Racket is a large family of languages like that. And so we write that at the top with hash laying Racket. Now, uh, when you program functionally and when you program in Racket in particular, it's really useful to write lots of test cases. And we're going to require a library for test cases called RackUnit. So every time you, every syntactic form in this version of Racket that I'll be using um, is wrapped in two bananas. So we've got the left banana over here, and then the name of the form that you want to use. Uh, and then at the end, there's the right banana. And so what this one does require is imports a library. So right now we're going to be importing the rack unit library, which is a unit testing library. So the first thing that I want to talk about is try to bridge. Yes? Is the imports a flat namespace? Uh, the imports correspond to, so the names like rack unit, that sort of thing, uh, they correspond roughly to like a directory structure. So you know, suppose that we wanted the rack unit check library, then we'd write it like that. But once something is imported, um, there's only one namespace. If you want, uh, require is itself a little language for specifying what you want. Uh, and so you could say something like, I want to require everything from rack unit, but I would like to prefix it with, um, you know, 42 colon. And what this does is this creates a pseudo module uh, that contains everything that rack unit does, but with 42 in front of it. And so rather than creating one of the one of the philosophies of Racket is that we want all features to be expressed inside of the language through the linguistic means. So rather than having some sort of default behavior that you have to work your way around by moving things around in the file system, let's say to get different names, instead of it, you can you can use and write extensions like prefixin that change what require does. And so actually prefixin is not something that's built in in some sort of deep sense. It's a function that you could have written. But we won't use any of that stuff, although um, Matthew might talk about it. Thanks. No problem. So to get started with functional programming, I want to start off with a really basic data structure that you're almost certainly familiar with called a singly uh, linked list. So a singly linked list is one of the first things you learn about in school. Um, and so to describe a singly linked list, you'd say something like, a singly linked list is either null uh, or it is what? A data, a pointer to data, and a pointer to a singly linked list. I'm writing at an angle. My fingers are really weird. Uh, so everyone's familiar with singly linked lists, I presume. Uh, by the way, my, the only languages that I like are uh, Racket, uh, Cock, and C. So I think of everything as a C program under the guise of a Racket program. So that's why I love singly linked lists and why I say pointer. Maybe you don't like pointers, but I love pointers. <laughs> okay, anyways. So how could we represent a singly linked list in Racket? So normally, well, you would define a new structure, like a node, you might call it, that has a pointer to data, so a data pointer, and then a next pointer. And so this is how we write that in Racket. We say there's a new kind of structure, and we give it the name node, and it has two pieces. In these pieces, one is the data pointer and one is the next pointer. And you could create instances of this by calling node uh, for, and then we'll write down null like this. So we have, this right here is a singly linked list that has four and then points to nothing. And we could put it inside, we could name that N1. Actually, let's name it N4 so we can keep track of them. And when we 
write this structure definition, it automatically comes out with functions <coughs> like node. Null, by the way, is built in. That's why I don't need to do it. Special. So, in addition to defining constructors like node, it gives us accessors like this. So, node dot data pointer n4. What would you expect this to return? Four. 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 We'd expect it to return four. So we can encode that as a check test case by writing check equal four. Now, if we if we look down at the bottom, it says node.datapointer is unbound. And that's because we are trying to be flagrantly different than Java uh, and C. So we write dot as a dash, just to be different. So when we run this, um, nothing happens. Uh, and the reason that nothing happens is that checks that work don't print anything out. So if I go over here and change this to 5 and run it, it's going to say this check failed. So when we see no output, that means that we did a good thing. Uh, I'm pressing uh, Command R to run the program, and then when I press Command R, it puts me down at the REPL, which I don't like, so I press um, uh, Apple E to go back up, so you can see what the magical keys are doing. So <clears throat> we could create more data structures like this, so we could have N54, uh, which is a node that has four, or five, and then points to N4, and we could write we could do something like, what would you expect would happen when you looked at the data pointer of the next pointer of N5? What would you expect that to be? Four, naturally. Okay. So it's called N454. Okay. So this works as expected. So to translate this into sort of C, we have N4.data pointer, or maybe you know, we'll use an arrow. And then here we have n54 arrow next pointer arrow data pointer. So this is a very basic version of converting something that you might know from C or Java into Rapid. Now, single linked lists are so important to the functional programming community that they're actually built in and you don't need to implement something like Node. But the way that they're built in uses different names. So we say that a list is either and we say null or um, a cons of data and a list. So this exact code that we wrote before, we could write it like this. We can say C4 is cons for a null, and um, C54 is cons 5 C4. And we could we would expect that when we look at the second piece of this list, we should find a 4. Now, how do we find the four? So before we wrote, you know, this node dash data pointer. Now, because of uh, Grandpa's eccentricities, uh, the names for the accessors of cons are incredibly exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that we write this is we write we want the car of the cutter of C four. Now, would anyone like bonus points for describing why they have these names? Mm -hmm. Contents of address register and contents of decrement register. <laughs> yeah, so they're named after the registers on the machine that Grandpa wrote the first Lisp interpreter on. And so we have inherited those names. Uh, and my favorite part <laughs> of the names is, is that uh, between C and D, or sorry, between C and R, you can write uh, any sequence of A's and D's, <coughs> actually provided there's at least one, so this is a regular expression. So any, any uh, string like that means something. Um, so for instance, what we really want right here uh, is a catter of that. And you read them, of course, from right to left, because why not? Now, <coughs> there, uh, Racket allows um, historical programming, you know, like it's 1960, if that's what you really want. But we prefer to write these out in a different style, um, using more informative names, such as, we want the first of the rest of C4. Uh, or we want, um, you know, maybe something like the second of C54. I know that's a little bit radical for some of you, um, but nevertheless. So, Lists like this um, can be used to represent the same kinds of things that singly linked lists do. They're the exact same data structure, they just have exciting names. So let's write a little function 
uh, on lists. So let's write the function link. So link is a function that consumes a list of anything um, and returns a number. So because we're good programmers, and when you become a functional programmer, you automatically become a good programmer. <laughs> um, what we do is we have to decide before we write this function how we're going to check whether or not the function is the right one. So one of the one of the principles of functional programming, in my opinion, is verification. And functional programming incorporates many different ways of verifying. Functional programmers from the type world, um, a major part of the reason that types are so useful is they integrate a huge part of verification into the program, uh, into the programming language itself to perform, to be performed for you automatically. Now, in a language like Bracket, we incorporate verification as well, although um, for the moment we're going to focus on verification through test cases. And functional programming makes test cases easy um, because we can, uh, if, if a function is actually a function, not a procedure, uh, then we can close all the inputs and all the outputs and capture what needs to be checked, as opposed to some function that was modifying memory. It would be hard to capture what it was supposed to be doing. So uh, I'll try to revisit this theme a few different times. So for instance, one test case would be that C54, its length should be 2, right? Okay. Now. We could write the function from this, um, but that would be immoral to do. Um, so we got to add some more test cases. So what would you expect the length of null to be? Maybe zero? Okay. Uh, and we could go on writing some more test cases. This is enough test cases uh, for now. We'll write more test cases later for other things. So to define a function, we write define, and we write length L. Now, so far, this function uh, is not right on most inputs. It's right on some inputs, but not all of them. Um, <clears throat> and so, the way that you can think about how a function looks in a functional language is, is that you're saying that this form, length of L, can be always replaced with 42. In math, um, when you write something like f of x equals x plus 4, and then you see later on, you know, f of 5, you know that you can replace that with 5 plus 4. And if you replace it and the function application goes away, the math will never change its meaning. This is an important principle of functional programming, that the fact that you call the function or not should be invisible to the meaning of the program. Functions are equivalent to their expansion. So you can think of this as saying that um, you know, whenever you see length of L, you can just replace that with 42. Now, of course, this is bad, right? This isn't really the input of this program. Or rather, the this is not actually a good length. So the way, that, the way that I like to write this is I can just say, well, let's, 42, that's never right with these test cases, but 2 will be right for at least one of them, right? Okay? So then what we can do is we can come back and say, you know, this test case should be 2 and this one should be 0, and it's not always right. Um, one, of, one of them isn't always right. So there must be some difference between these two test cases. What is that difference? How can we distinguish between these two different test cases in our function? And we can do that because in the first one where we return 2, L was a cons. And in the one where it's 0, L was an empty, right? So we can say, if L is a cons, then return 2, otherwise return 0. So now this program passes all of our test cases, so it must be the right program, right? Do I have any disagreement out there in the audience? <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's right for what you're doing. Yeah, so you might, you might think this is the wrong program, but to be a functional programmer, you have to provide evidence that it's the wrong program. And the way that you provide evidence that, the wrong, that it's the wrong program is with a counterexample. And a counterexample might be something like, well, if you just do C4, then that should be 1. Right? Because C4 only has one thing in it, but C54 has two. So now that test case fails. So now we have to go in and say, you know, what's the difference between these two test cases? They're both returning two right now. That means that they must both be flowing into this branch. So we have to determine what's the difference between these two. Now, we could say something dumb, like, well, if the first thing in that list um, <coughs> is 
5, then we should return 2, otherwise we should return 1. So this is, of course, a program, but it's a horrible program. Um, this is an implausible generalization of 2 and 1. Now, what, of course, we know we really want to do is we want to add 1 to the length of the rest of the list. So, uh, oh, we are adding 1 to rest, but we really want the rest of the list. Notice that the error said um, actual is 1 verse 2. I'm not sure why I did that. Rest must be bound to something interesting. Anyways, um, so we have now all our test cases passing. So this is an example of a functional program. <laughs> As you see, uh, it's naturally recursive over the structure of the input. The input is made up of two different cases, the empty case and the cons case, and so our function naturally has two branches in it. Branch one for the cons case and branch two for the empty case. The cons case is allowed to look at the first and the rest, and so in this case it only looks at the rest. Now, to convert this functional programming functional program to maybe what you're more familiar with uh, would be something like Java, where rather than writing one length function that starts off by saying, did I get a cons or an empty, you would write two versions of the length function, one for empty lists and one for cons lists, and they would use a common interface of lists to dispatch. So essentially when you're writing in a functional program, um, oftentimes the dispatching is written by you rather than being provided by the programming language. Now, this might sound like a disadvantage for functional programming, because the object-oriented programming language provides a feature for you automatically. It lets you not have to think about the dispatching. But I'm a functional programming chauvinist, so why would I tell you any flaws in functional programming? There must be a reason that this is really better, right? You've got some magic sauce somewhere. Yeah, there's magic sauce somewhere. <laughs> now, this is a uh, famous problem that you may have heard of. Uh, it often goes by the expression problem. Anyone heard of this? Yeah, so, the expression problem is that functional makes it easy to add functions, and OO makes it easy to add kinds. The idea here being that when you add a new kind in OO, you can write down the definition of all the functions of that interface for this new kind that you so it is cheap to put all those function definitions in one place, rather than having to go out and find all the functions out there that use this new kind of thing. In contrast with functional programming, when you add a new function, you don't need to tell anybody about it. You don't need to tell all the different objects um, that there's this new function on the block that they have to implement, which you do in an OO world. But the consequence of that is that when you add a new kind, you have to go modify every function definition. So these are orthogonal um, these are orthogonal uh, uh, problems. So, in some scenarios, you want to add more functions, and some you want to add more kinds. And advanced features of programming languages like Racket, Enclosure, and Scala are all about mitigating the expression problem by allowing you to do have both at the same time. And there are different ways that those advanced features do that. But at its core, functional programming has this trade-off. Any uh, Further questions, opinions about the expression problem for Ben and you in the back who also knew this was? That I missed? Levi. Yes, Levi, sorry. We chat on the mail later. Alright, so let's write another function. So let's write the function uh, all even. Actually, do you want to write another list function or do you want to move on to something more interesting? This function. Okay, let's write another list function. Alright, so let's write the function um, all even. So what all even is going to do. It's going to take a list of numbers, and it's going to return a bool. I say bool because my students make fun of me for saying boolean. I'm from Massachusetts, and we say boolean there. Some people <laughs> like to say boolean. I don't know what they're thinking. But anyways, uh, so all even, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to tell you whether or not every number in that list is even. So for instance, we could write some examples. So all even of null is what? Question mark. Let's leave that here for a while. All even of the list that contains 1, 2, and 3. 
certainly false, right? Because uh, 3 is not even. There are other numbers that are even, but 3 in particular. Uh, and then if we look at a number, one like um, list of 2, 4, and 6, that's going to be true. Okay? So we could, if we wanted, go through the same laborious process of letting the test cases tell us how the structure of this program is going to look. However, as you become a more advanced functional programmer, you'll immediately recognize when your function is going to follow the schematic structure of the data that it's consuming. And so we can know, even before really thinking about much, that this program is going to look like this. Is the list empty? Do something. Otherwise, do something else. And this other thing that we do is probably going to look at the first of the list, and it's probably going to look at all even of the rest of the list. Almost every functional program on lists starts from this core. We call this the template, um, and it's uh, automatically derived from the data definition. If you want to sort of pair this with knowledge that you might have from a language like Java, you kind of think of it as you're writing down all the fields of this kind of thing and how you might use them. So, uh, everyone know what this should be? I've got that, under, I've got that question mark there. So, are all the elephants in my hand pink? Yes. yes. Naturally, this is totally true, because there are no elephants. It's called vacuous truth. Okay? So we should definitely put a true there. Now, we don't really care what the first is. We really care about its evenness. Okay? So we want to ask whether this thing is even. And if it is even, then we should also ask if everything else is even. But if it isn't even, then we know that there's a problem, right? So we could write, if this is true, then look at the evenness of everything else. Otherwise, not. So this function right here is the right one. Um, but now, this is horrifically ugly. <coughs> this implementation. Does everyone agree that it's horrible? <laughs> Terrible. Yeah, it's horrific. We really... Like, what we're really doing right here is we're expanding and. Because this is what and means. And says both of those things have to be true. And if the first one isn't, don't even bother with the second one. So we should always use an abstraction rather than implement the abstraction ourselves. This is another principle of programming, but it's a principle of programming that is especially easy to apply in functional programming. Because you know that abstractions never carry with them baggage because they're equivalent to their expansion. That's one of the principles that we talked about before. And so you're always safe using an abstraction rather than implementing it yourself. And learning more and more kinds of abstractions is one of the main reasons why functional programming feels so valuable to many people. And the fact that functional programming sets up the world such that it's easy to create abstractions is another sort of win for it. Now, there's a particular kind of um, abstraction called a higher order function. Now, a higher order function is a function that produces and consumes other functions. Now, this is something that um, you can't really do in Java, but you can do in C, one of my favorite languages. Um, because C has function pointers, right? So you can dynamically create them, you know, because you just implement your own JIT right there. Um, produce a new function and then pass around some function pointers. Java 8 makes it possible. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's not really Java. I mean, that's just, they're just chasing racket now. <laughs> okay, so all even can be implemented by a particularly cute higher order function. Um, now, the easiest way to explain this is to look schematically at what all even is doing. So I'm going to take this example right here and convert it um, into a different form. So we know that it's equivalent to true, right? Because, as I mentioned, functions are equivalent to their expansion, and this one expands to true. But what does it do first? The first thing that it does, oops, the first thing that it does is it expands to cons to this, okay? So these two programs behave exactly the same. Because that's what list means, okay? So, what we can do then is we can say, what would all even do were it given a cons? 
But what it would do is this. So we're going to put this right. We're going to put this there. So we're going to plop in the definition of all even. But now the list that we're all evening is this one. Okay. So that's the list that we're all evening. If I hit run, the program still behaves the same. And so what is the first of this list? It's 2. So we can just replace that with 2. And what is the rest of this list? Well, it's 4 and 6. So if we continue this process, we're going to discover that this code right here is equivalent to and even 2 and even 4 and even 6, then true at the end. And that's what these programs mean. Because what we've done is we've run the program symbolically on the input that it was given, and this right here is what we saw. <coughs> now what does that mean? Given that this list right here is really just another way of writing cons2, cons4, con6, empty, bang, bang, bang. Okay. So what's going on here? What's going on is that this function, all even, its job, all even, its job, all even's job is to turn empty into true. See, because this empty down here got turned into true. And turn cons A, R, into and even A, dot, dot, dot. That's what its job is. This function, all it's doing is it's taking the structure of the list and turning that list into a computation that has the exact same structure. There's a function that always does this, and it's called, it has a delightful name. We're going to say all even with awesome. In brackets, we have a meaning to uh, symbols. They're not, they're not enforced by the language, but we use them. So question marks, you pronounce as hump. So this is all even hump. And slash, you pronounce as with. So this is all even hump with awesome. Okay. Now all even hump with awesome is going to call a function. And this function is called, oh, by the way, this there's a Greek name for this. Does anyone know what the Greek name for this is? Kimball knows what it is. Yeah. Catamorphism. It is a catamorphism. <coughs> okay. So Racket has this awesome function called catamorphism. <laughs> so, to be a Racket programmer, you have to understand. So what you do when you use catamorphism, what you do is you tell it what it should turn conses into and what it should turn empties into. So what we say is, to, you're going to turn cons into and, even, that thing, the rest. That's what you're going to turn cons into, and you're going to turn empties into true, and you're going to do this for L. Now this function right here is the same function. Although it says that it doesn't know what catamorphism is. Matthew, did, is this the latest release? <laughs> oh, so it's not the latest release. So it uses the old name for catamorphism, which is foldr. <laughs> now the other thing is that this doesn't know what A and R are. So <clears throat> in this code right here, or rather in this comment, we are referring to A and R as the pieces of a cons. Now those names are not names that the programming language knows about. They're only names that we use in our comments, so we have to tell the language about them. And the way that we tell the language about them uh, is by a different Greek word. It's actually a Greek letter, lambda. And we say, A, R, those are the names that we're going to use for the two pieces of a cons. We're going to call one piece A and the other piece R. I actually prefer to call them A and D to remind me of my ancestors. Okay. So this code right here does the exact same thing as this one. Let's copy this stuff down here. And we'll replace these with awesome. So awesomeify it. Okay. So the code, boom, no output. This is uh, functional programs. They're most exciting when they don't. They don't have any output because 
you know, why bother bragging to the world about all the good things we've done? We just want to be caught with our problems. Do you have a comment? Speaking of ancestors, when did ha huh become ha huh rather than like all even p? Ah, yes. So, um, so there was a schismatic war in the uh, 1970s between the rival factions of the Lisp world. Um, and my ancestors, uh, it was really actually over this issue that you bring up about dash P versus question mark. So we don't really like talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, traditionally there's dash P, which is for a predicate. Um, and so I believe that uh, closure kind of uses dash P's a lot. No. Um, no. Um, Common list definitely really. does, but they're heretics, so who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So folder uh, is an example of one of these higher order functions. Because what's happening here is that this thing right here, when I said we had to name those arguments, or we had to name those pieces, lambda isn't just funny syntax where we name the pieces of the cons. Folder doesn't know anything about lambda. Folder, all it's really doing is it's consuming a function that takes in two things. If we write down the type of folder, it's got an incredibly exciting type. It goes like this, a to b to b, b, list of a, arrow b. <coughs> Let me move that up for you. Okay. So the first function, what it's going to do is it's going to take in two things, the a, the same thing will not. The same thing that the list is carrying, and it's going to produce, and then it's also going to take in a b. And the b is the thing that the whole function is going to produce. Because remember, what folder does is it transforms a data structure into a structurally identical computation. So that means every occurrence of the data structure inside of itself becomes the same kind of computation. So if the whole thing is going to produce a B, this one's going to produce a B. And then it cr uh, now the list might be empty, so that means that you have to give it a B for if it gets to the end, mm -hmm. or if it starts at the end. And then that's what comes out. And so folder is this schematic function. Now, a really awesome function that you can implement with folder is sum. So we can write check equal uh, sum, one, two, three, four. Of course, we've got to give it a list. And that's going to be 10. Now, this is a really cool example because the function that we want already exists. It already has the well-known name plus. And in this case, a equals b, and they're both the same as that. So folder is a very powerful function. Um, and it represents another kind of abstraction that you can build with functional programming. Now, this is an example of how this, every function that calls folder is a recursive function that's the same kind of recursion as every other one on lists. Basically, almost all functions on lists are really just folders. 90% of them. Another very popular function uh, is one called map. Map's type is this. A to B, list of A, arrow, list of B. So for instance, we can call we can call it evenify that's going to map evenness over the list. So what this does is we could do check equal um, evenify list 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's going to be list of false, true, false, true. Right? Because what this does is it takes the list and transforms every element according to this function. It projects the function it projects the elements through this function from A to B. And so again, this is a way of not having to think about the structure of your computation. Computation, You can focus on the computation itself. Another way of using and building advanced abstractions. And these are all based on the ability of functions to consume functions. Any comments? Yes. Is folder like reduce? Yes. Okay. Yep. And map is like map. <laughs> <laughs> so on line 101, can you just explain the syntax? Sure. So this is a function call, and it's taking three arguments. 
Argument one is plus. Sure. So plus is a function that takes a to b to b. It just so happens that it's nat, nat, nat. Zero is a b, which is a nat. And l is a list of a, really because it's a list of nats. And so this is a function called that's taking three arguments. So plus right here is just a function. So if I can do it, I can like, uh, I can put plus in a list with all the other arithmetic operators. So arithmetic. And so this is not some weird thing where I'm adding lists to subtracting division and multiplication or something like that. So they're just the names. So every function is in, every function call is inside bananas. It's not in bananas, not a function call. Any other, did you have a question that I can answer? Well, so I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm really looking at that thinking, well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, just, just just your notation for the types of functions. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. So for instance, you know, let's write my favorite language C. So we were, we could write num f. Uh, well, let's do int. You know, <laughs> int f, int x, int y, something there. Okay. So this is this is the way that you might write a, a function header at C or Java or something like that. So we can talk about all functions that have this same header. Because so this this header right here mentions f. So we can talk about all functions that have the same header as int int arrow int, because it consumes two ints and produces one int. And this has the advantage of not being specific to the name. Yeah. And so here we're saying a b b because this function folder, uh, it doesn't care what kind of thing it is. So it works with naturals, it works with strings, it works with booleans. So for instance, all even, aw all even awesome, um, a is number and b is bool, whereas down here with sum, a and b are both number. Okay. How long do we have? Um, about half hour left. Total or for me? Uh, for you. Okay, just making sure. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so we have, I want to do two more examples of more interesting functions on data. Um, you have three choices. We can do insertion sort, we can do binary trees, or we can do zippers. Do I do zippers. insertion sort? Zip, zipper, zipper. <laughs> well, we can get to zipper. <laughs> I think we got two choices. Should I go to binary trees first or insertion sort? Insertion no sort. No one wants to answer now that going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I'm a little curious about, you talked about the expression problem about types and defining types. Is it any different than just defining a function? A type versus function? Because you're talking about naturals and booleans and ah, the okay. arguments never type check. Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay. So uh, Or is it always just a list? Yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Okay, so this is deep this is deep stuff. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. Functions have types. All okay. functions have types. <clears throat> now the question is whether these types are enforced by your programming language. We can look at C code. And it has types. When you look at Perl code, they actually have types. The question is whether you're required to write them down, and if you did write them down, whether the language would do anything useful with the fact that you wrote them down. Um, so when I write down something like folder has this type, I'm talking about folder as a platonic ideal. It in fact has this type. Now, there's another question. Is Racket a language that's going to enforce that? So. Uh, I want to limit myself talking about Racket itself and more functional programming. So functional programming in general, I think, would agree with the statement that functions in fact have types, and we want to we want to allow you to 
use that knowledge to your advantage to make your life easier, to make it more likely to create correct programs. Languages like ML and Haskell attempt to um, enforce those types automatically for you. Um, languages like Hawk allow you to say it, but they don't really enforce it automatically. They make you do it automatically. They make you do it, and they'll just check your work. Um, and languages like Racket say they really do have this type, and if you ever try to do something wrong, we're going to catch you at the last instant. Same with like Perl and Ruby. They, they kind of have a similar feel. But something that we try to do in the Racket world is we think that there's not necessarily one right way to check invariants. Um, because some invariants are far more complicated than we currently have automated decision procedures to determine. So when you use ML and Haskell, there are some correct programs, some functions that really have the type you think, that their automatic checkers are going to reject. This is necessarily the case. It's a consequence of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So because of that, that means that they're going to reject good programs. From our perspective, we would like to empower you to check your programs however you wish. And so we do that at many different levels. There's a statically typed variant of Racket called typed Racket. Um, when you're programming Racket in the large, you're often going to use a dynamically enforced contract system that allows you to express more complicated types than a language like ML or Haskell would be able to. And at, in the last, in, in sort of the worst case, um, we're going to protect the virtual machine um, the actual language implementation to guarantee to respect your abstractions so you can never do stuff like jump to random code or add strings in five. Um, so all that put together means that if your function really has some type, we would like to empower you to write that down and check as many pieces of it as possible. And we don't, we, we're not insistent that the only way to check is statically at compilation time. All right, so <clears throat> let's write, um, let's make some binary trees. I love binary trees, so let's use them. So we're going to find a structure called uh, BT, um, and we'll say uh, BT leaf, and it has no pieces. And then we'll say uh, BT node, actually let's call it BT branch. Let's do node, actually, because it's the same number of letters. Okay. <laughs> then we've got the value, the left, and the right. And uh, maybe to be cute, let's put the left to the left of the value. Okay. So what are some examples of binary trees? So one would be the BT node that has leaves at the end and five. So that right there is a binary tree. So let's call this uh, B5. Okay. And then we could also make uh, B6. Why don't leaves have values? Uh... You know, there's lots of different kinds of binary trees. These ones have no values. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this one, let's ha let's say that it's got a leaf on the left, then a six, and then B five is on the right. Actually, let's put it the other way. So we're not we're not egregiously weird. Okay. Now then, let's make um, you know, let's make a big binary tree. Uh, that has, um, let's put 7 and then B6 over there. Ooh, you know, let's do 4. And then over here, we'll do a binary tree node that has uh, 3 there. So this is just some weird tree. Nothing particularly interesting about it. If we wanted to draw it with ASCII art, we could do that. But let's not. Okay? So let's write. Um, and let's assume, so, so binary trees, of course, are just data structures. Uh, but let's assume that we're going to enforce the binary tree invariant that small things are on the left and big things are on the right. Okay. So let's write a lookup function that's going to take a binary tree and a value that you're looking up and tell you whether or not it's there. So lookup is going to take a binary tree, which will say a binary tree is either a leaf or node. Okay? And it's going to take a number. Uh, well, it's going to take a value. So this is a binary tree of A's. It's going to take an A and return a bool. Now, our example binary tree, so these 
are all BT of number. But really, lookup doesn't care what kind of thing it's going to take. Okay? So we can write some tests. So we'll say check equal uh, lookup in BB. Let's look up and see if uh, 5 is there. And of course it is, so we'll say true. But if we look up 2, then it's not there. Sounds good. Okay. Sorry? Uh, it is because BB on its right has B6, B6 on its left has B5, and then 5's there. I tricked you. Okay. So, in the same way that every function on lists looks very similar, every function on binary trees is going to look very similar too. It's going to start off saying, did I get a leaf? If so, I'd do something. Or did I get a node? And if I got a node, then I can look at the BT node left of the BT. Uh, and I can also look at the, there's four pieces that I can, three pieces that I can look at. And then the left, the value, and the right. Now, if statements normally only have two sides, and sometimes that can be annoying, um, you know, because you've got to like, have lots of indentation. And so we typically use a con, which is just equivalent to a bunch of nested if statements. Okay. So I'm just going to reformat. That also makes it more convenient so you can see that these four things all go together. All right? <coughs> So, if I go to a leaf and I'm looking for something, it doesn't matter what I was looking for, I didn't find it. Okay? Now, if I've got this value, then there's three possibilities. Possibility one is, is that the thing that I'm looking for is this. And if that's the case, then I return true, right? Otherwise, if the thing I'm looking for is smaller than it, then I want to go to the left, right? So I'll look up on the left this same value, and otherwise I want to look it up on the right. Okay, so this is a binary tree lookup. So I don't want I don't really care about binary tree lookups, but binary trees are a good example. They're a good example because we can talk about stuff like insertion. So insertion will have a really interesting consequence in a functional programming world. So suppose that we wanted to insert a value into the tree. So if you come from a um, imperative programming world, probably what you want to, what you're thinking about doing is you want to find the place where the tree, where this new node is going to go. And then you're going to, like, move stuff around. And it's complicated, right? And scary. It's going to be really easy in the functional programming world. So all we're going to do is, if we go to a leaf, and we're trying to put something in, well, then clearly we want a node there, because the list, uh, sorry, the tree was empty before. And... By the way, I wrote, I wrote lookup first because it follows the exact same structure. If the thing that we're looking for is already there, then these, these, bin these, in, these binary trees, they really represent sets, so it doesn't make sense to insert something in twice. So we don't need to do anything when the thing is already there. If it isn't already there, then we should go insert it on the left if it was smaller. So we'll go insert it on the left, or we'll insert it on the right. Now the problem with this, with these as it is, is that this insert looks like it's injecting it in. But if we look at the type, what it's really doing is returning a new list. Sorry, a new binary tree. And so what's the difference between a binary tree that has V on the left and one that doesn't? Well, it has, it's still a node, and it still has this value and it still has this right-hand side, but the left is now different. Similarly, if we inserted it on the left, then, sorry, if we inserted it on the right, then the left is still the same, but we just have a new right. 
So what this means is that when we do something like, you know, we can we know that lookup returns false on two with BB. See right here, returns false on two with BB. So let's do this. So we'll, we'll look at it three times. Now, in between the first two times, we're going to insert two in, and after that, we should expect to find it, right? But the most important thing is this line 171. This line continues to be false because we have not injected two into this data structure. We've returned a totally new <coughs> data structure. Actually, that's not correct. It's not totally new. We've returned a new data structure that does not have that uh, does have two, but the other one is left the same. So these test cases just pass. Do you write programs and they just work? The second you type them, I didn't type run before, right? Maybe it's just these are really easy, but I think it really is practice. Just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes you write programs correct the first time. Okay. So if we were to look, oops, if we were to look at the data structures that came out of these, let's print them out. Uh, you've never seen me print out anything, by the way. Because my programs, when they work, they don't do anything. Um, <coughs> let's look at, um, let's return a list of the two trees. And by just putting it here out in the open, it's going to print it out. It's going to print it out in a very exciting way, I hope. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so structures by default are opaque. And so we can't see what's inside them. We can make them not opaque. What's the opposite of opaque? It's transparent. So we just say, make those things transparent. Now, it's still not It's not super exciting. What did I do wrong? I wanted to see the sharing. Yeah. Is there? Is it a flag in your setup? Yeah, you can say, if you want to dynamically change it, it's Grab. Alright. Ignore that. Ooh, I've got an idea. Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> I won't try to show you the cool way, but the important thing is, is that look. When we insert it on the left, the right-hand side stayed exactly the same. So we had one tree that was like this, and now we have a new tree that like overlaps most of the time. Every direction that it didn't go during the insertion stays the same. So these two trees share half of all their nodes. Because every node, only the left or the right was changed, never both. So kind of what that means is that this insert, it is, um, it's log n in time, because we got to go that many times there. Then it's also log n in space as well, because we only change nodes along the trail, along the path to the one that you cared about. And uh, now we'll get to the advanced material, which is a zipper. Okay? So a zipper answers the question, how can we do this even faster? or even with less space. And so the idea of the zipper uh, is a new kind of data structure that stores, you can think of it as like a cursor inside of the data structure where you're currently editing. Like this cursor on the screen right here, I can like move it up, down, left, and right. And when I insert something in, it doesn't take log n time to insert it. It happens like instantaneously, right? So the idea here is, is that you have a data structure that you're inside of, and we want to figure out how to map how we got there and go backwards or move it around. That sort of thing. So a zipper has two things. It's got a path uh, and a focus. So the path that got us there and the focus of where we are. Uh, if you look down at your own zippers, uh, they're mostly closed. That's the focus. If they're down a little bit, and I won't... <laughs> if they're down a little bit, then the amount that they're down is the path. So there's the part that's open behind the zipper, and the part that's closed, which is in front of it. That's the focus. You're currently looking at the focus, and everything else is behind you. So what does a path look like? Well, a path in a tree, so a tree path, 
has two different kinds. You either went left, and there was a value that you went past, and there's a tree that you went past on the right. Or, you went right, and there was a tree on your left and a value that you went past. Yes, you missed the spot. Oh, you're still first time. Right there? Okay, very good. Okay, so what's an example of a zipper? So a BBC is the zipper that's looking at BB. Now, if we're looking at the top of BB, the path is empty. We didn't go anywhere. Okay? So how could we move left in a zipper? So we can move left. We have some zipper. So what do we want to do? Well, what we want to do is we want to create a new zipper. Well, first of all, the zipper currently has some path and some focus. So match define is pattern matching. It's a way of naming those pieces without having to call the construct the, the accessors. Then the, the focus right now, the focus is either a BT leaf, in which case you can't move left, right? Because if you're at the end, you can't go inside of the left of a, of a leaf. So we should error here and say can't. Mm -hmm. But if we had a node, then the node had a left, a value, and a right. So what we do is we create a new zipper, and this new zipper has a new focus. Its focus is the left. Okay. Now, we have to record the new path to how we got here. Now, the new path, it's a one new thing plus the old path. Now, what's the new thing that we did? The new thing that we did is we went left. And what did we go left past? We went left past the value, and we went last path, path, we went left past the right. So this right here allows us to move left. And moving right is very similar, except that we record that we move right past the left, mm -hmm. and the new focus is the right. Okay. Now, how do we move up? We move up, <coughs> ah, focus Z, match. Well, we don't really care what the focus is, right? What we do to move up is we're really interested in what the path was. Because if the path is empty, then you can't move up, right? Because you haven't gone anywhere. So we say move up, can't. And if we say, if there is something there, then it's a cons. And what if we had, what if we got here from moving left? That means we went past some value, right? So there's the old path. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to turn a new zipper that has the old path and has a new B-tree node that has the focus as the left, because we know that we went left to get here, then the value and the right stay the same. So we sort of use the path to store the, the information that we're going to need to go back up later. And right is very similar. Right has the left, and that. And the only difference is, is that the focus is on the right. Okay. And now there's the whole reason we're doing this. By the way, every single one of these movements is O1, both in space and time. Now the key about why zippers are cool is that you can replace at the point in the zipper. So all you do there is you have the zipper that has some path and some focus, and you just say, I'm going to ignore the current focus and put in something new. And I just throw away that focus because I don't care about it anymore. So what does this let us do? So what we can do is we can have BBZ, so BBZ right there. So BBZ is some zipper that's pointing to, um, what's the list look like? I mean the, the tree. The tree starts with four there. So it starts with four, and let's go left to the three. 
So we can say move left. So now we're where the 3 was. Then we can say move uh, right. Okay. Now right there, there should be um, a leaf. So let's replace that leaf with a node um, that has some value. What's a value that's between 3 and 4? Pi. Uh, yeah, pi would be a good one. Let's do 3.5 though, because we don't have all night. Okay. So now we're going to replace it. Then we got to move up to go back past the right. Then we got to whoops. Then we got to move up again to undo the fact that we moved left. Now we're back at the top, and we can look at the zipper focus. Okay. Okay. And if we look at this. It's going to be a list that has all the same things as before, but there's going to be a 3.5 there. So see? The list starts with 4, so the tree starts with 4, and on the left, there's a 3 with a 3.5 on its right, and on the right, everything was the same. And so this zipper allows us to incrementally modify the tree, but we're not really modifying it, we're incrementally creating new trees every step in O1 time. Now this one, you know, we go, we move ourselves in, make the change, and then go backwards. Doing an operation like this is the same login performance as before. But if we wanted to sequence a bunch of changes, if we did insert multiple times in a row, we're going to be churning mem memory, changing this, changing this prefix, doing some stuff, and then going back and changing it again. But the, what the zipper allows us to do go to a place in the data structure, make a bunch of changes, and then back our way out. Question, Ben? Um, about how time is on. Yep. So, um, in summary, in the last minute, functional programming um, is primarily about creating new forms of abstractions using an unbounded form of programming where you're not limited by functions that only consume flat values. To become a good functional programmer, you have to learn to think about verification at every moment of your programming. And one of the ways that this is not painful is by learning about new, more interesting forms of abstractions. Many people believe that functional programming is inherently less performant because it's not allowed to break the rules and sort of warp time um, by using mutation. But zippers are an interesting example of how that's not the case. And in fact, you can provide <coughs> more features mainly the persistence that zippers allow, um, but with no downside in performance. And in fact, zippers have another really cool thing, and this will be the last thing, that a zipper is actually the partial derivative of a data structure with respect to the, to the position under focus. <laughs> Say that one more time. <laughs> a zipper is a partial derivative of a data structure with respect to the position under focus. And this is just beautiful. And when... Uh, you know, a benefit, a side benefit of doing being a functional programmer is not only will you get better, shorter, more correct programs, but you'll learn uh, beautiful Greek words like catamorphism, lambda, and you might even learn about partial derivative of digital. So thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this introduction to functional programming. And next we'll have an introduction about bracket. Thank you for the class.